extremism. I don't care if it's dietary extremism. I don't care if it's spiritual extremism, political extremism, ideological extremism, religious extremism. It never works in the long run. Because the average human being isn't equipped or interested or has the motivation or effort to live an extreme life. So if we want to bring veganism and vegetarianism to African people, let's do it in a very realistic, practical, and patient fashion. Let's get away from the all or nothing proposition because we're going to lose more than we gain. Hi, I'm Alden. And I'm Calden. And we have the privilege of uh, talking today with uh, one, of, one of the great advocates for uh, black people, Dr. Dr. Umar, Umar Johnson. Johnson. I'd like for you to start by first of all telling us a little bit about yourself. Not as if everybody doesn't know you already, mm -hmm. but sure. just to give a little background knowledge. Uh, certainly. I'm Dr. Umar Johnson, doctor of clinical psychology, a certified school psychologist, certified school principal. I'm also a political scientist, a blood relative of the great Frederick Douglass, a former Minister of Education for Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, author of the book, Psychoacademic Holocaust, uh, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. I'm a private practice and school psychologist where I evaluate children in an effort to keep them out of special ed, away from ADHD and off of the dangerous psychiatric medications. Um, founder of a movement, the National Independent Black Parent Association, where we try to organize black parents to fight to protect their children in school. And I'm currently I'm in the middle of an effort to raise $2 million right. to purchase the St. Paul's College, a historically black college in Virginia, that we want to rechristen into the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. Yeah. So is that going to be a, a charter school, basically? Nah, independent. 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 Charter independent. schools are still public schools by law. Okay. And we really don't want the local or state Department of Education dictating our curriculum okay. and our school culture. So it's going to be independent. Of course, it's going to be tougher that way because that means there's no outside money. Right. But we believe as Pan-Africanists and Garveyites that what is to be done for black people must be done by black people. Tell us a, a little bit about the curriculum at the school mm -hmm. and why. Uh, in the, but give it to us in baby steps. I got you. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, right now, <clears throat> the dominant narrative of public education in America is to prepare children to go to college. Okay. Schools exist to get your child into college. Right. For African children, that's not a worthy goal because college doesn't guarantee opportunity. That's right. It doesn't even guarantee a job. Right. We have to do better than that. Right. College is sending black people into debt. Right. With lifelong poverty right. in the form of student loans. Right. We have to prepare our children not for college, but for economic self-development. So at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, our children will be trained in at least 12 different expertises, expertise areas, where they will be able to take that and turn it into a business the day after they graduate from high school. I don't want our children to have to go to college in order to access wealth. I don't want them to have to go to college in order to earn a living. I want them to be in a position to earn that living right after high school graduation. So they will be taught how to do documentary films. They will be taught how to make um, vegan food. Uh, they will be taught the real estate industry. Uh, by the time a child is done ninth grade, they will have mastered the real estate market in, in, in their native state. By the time they're done the 11th grade, they will have their own stock portfolio. By the time they've done um, their third year of school, they would have already mastered multinational investments in stocks. Before they graduate, they will know how to do their own taxes. So we want to make sure that they are economically sophisticated and economically adept. Because the top 1% richest people in America never went to college. Not only did they not go to college, most of them live off of unearned income. So while we're slaving, they're sleeping, making more money in their sleep than Passive we do income. on the job. Yeah. Passive, Passive income. income. Say so we're into the income. You talked mm -hmm. about agriculture in, in the first, in that segment just a yes. second ago. You talked about agriculture and the, the economic independence of, yes. of agriculture. Besides agriculture, what are some other um, avenues? You just talked about documentary and things yeah. like that. 
for, for, for tourism. Okay. Black people spend a disproportionate amount of their disposable income on tourism. Right. Bob Johnson sold BET to Viacom in 2000 for $2 billion, I believe it was. He did that because he wanted to go into tourism. Mm -hmm. He believed he could make more money in tourism than he could with BET. Okay. The problem was racism kept him from getting into that particular uh, industry the way he wanted to. Mm -hmm. We want to teach our children how to capture those black tourism dollars. The amount of money that we spend traveling, flying, floating, but we don't own any commercial That's ships. Right. We don't own Market. any airlines. Oh. We own not a single, uh, uh, what do we want to call that, um, franchised hotel. There's not a single black franchised hotel on the planet Earth that I'm aware of. We have black hotels, but it's not franchised. So it's in one location and one location only. Right, right. That makes no sense with the type of money we spend traveling. So we want to teach our children how to capitalize on that. Clothing production and manufacturing. Very important. Our children will be taught how to make clothing. That's another area where we're spending a significant proportion of our disposable income. We want to teach them how to make their own clothes. Okay. Now, you brought up airlines. You brought mm -hmm. up clothing. Now, I'm going to... might mm -hmm. sound like I'm taking a jab. No, that's all right. Tyler Perry just mm -hmm. went in negotiation to buy an airline. Mm -hmm. You got um, Damon Dash. You got mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Shark Tank. Damon... Um, you, you got... Uh -huh. Blacks, right. I'm leaning towards another question. Sure. You, because you talk about it a lot of times about wealth of those that. Mm -hmm. What's the answer for? Is there an answer to change? Uh, the, uh, is it, is there something they can do, or is it is it? I'm, 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 how do I how do I put the question? Is it something they? Because there's a lot they can do. The problem is the higher you go as an African in this country, on the economic and entertainment food chain, the closer you are in direct contact with white people of power you understand thereby the less freedom you feel to reach out and help your own people it's ironic and it's contradictory but the richest amongst us are the least inclined to do something because the more money you have the closer white people watch you. so how do they change that well how can they you know what i mean mm -hmm. not, not critical of no of, no, no of, i understand of, of i understand success. they have to move as a group the reason why i say that mm -hmm. because our spectrum is from Okay, Booker T. Washington and, and W.E. Du Bois had a mm -hmm. debate their whole life. Yeah. You know that. I mean, yeah. you, what I felt like what they could have done was come was together in some kind of way, bridge the gap to right. be able to join forces to, 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 to create a movement. Right. So, so, but it was tough to do. You, we. Well, well, we so, yeah, so. also, <laughs> it wasn't so much ideology between Booker T. and W.E.B. Du Bois, but ego. It was ego. It was Same ego. thing with W.E.B. Du Bois and Garvey. Right. It wasn't ideology. Du Bois started out as a Pan-African himself. He was jealous that Marcus Garvey was able to organize black people coming from another country, Jamaica, okay. than he could. It was jealousy okay. that led to most of those conflicts. So if you were speaking to Tyler Perry, if you mm -hmm. had the, the voice of uh, Damon Dash, what would, uh, I'm not, I don't know that you hadn't had that mm -hmm. conversation mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. what would... My question what, for them would be, if you're buying an airline, if you're doing any, if you're participating in any major economic undertaking, how are you going to use this vehicle to improve the condition of your people? Because you can buy an airline as a black person and use it just as another, another capitalistic instrument to get paid. There's dozens of black businesses that serve white people more than they serve black folk and hardly have any black people in managerial positions. So Tyler Perry buying an airline is going to mean nothing to black people unless he, some if, unless he somehow comes up with a way to use that to benefit us. Just like with President Obama. Right, Him right. Because of becoming president in and of itself in no way benefits black people unless you're going to use that influence to some extent to open up some doors, which he has not done in seven years. Well, I, I had to go back to him because, you see, my, my thought process is something you spoke of earlier. We got some earlier footage of you just mm -hmm. a minute ago where you, you had, uh, you know, some uh, a, a, a part of a documentary, mm -hmm. and you, you you mentioned the thought process because I'm a big on the the, the power of the mind. Because, yes, yes. Okay, so yes. how do we make this be realistic to me or the average person? Because what mm -hmm. you're saying, I get Tyler Perry. He did his thing. He, he mm -hmm. got his. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. Yeah. And and, and Mr. Fubu Damon, you know, mm -hmm. he, he did his thing. Damon Dasher did yes. his as well. You yes. know. So how do I, you know, change my situation to make it where I can be? Because this, we talking wealth. Yes. We talking billions. We yes. talking and so to the average person, you know, we, we don't even li live in a world of of, of yeah. being yeah, financially. Sixty-five percent yeah. of sixty-five uh, percent of African American have no 
Exactly. No, right. no, what, no net worth. They have no net worth. Yeah. Even the so-called middle class. Even so-called right. middle right. class. And America actually manufactured the black middle class. It's really an idea. It's yeah. not a reality. It's not because class speaks to ownership of wealth. And it's actually the average oxymoron. middle class. Oh, exactly. And, and it's an antithesis to wealth. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. It's not a stepping stone. You can't go through that mentality like so. This is what I'm gonna start and go with. You almost have to almost unplug and walk away from that exactly. mentality to go. Exactly. To find, uh, and America right. was very slick because they re-engineered the definition of class. Right. Okay. Class no longer includes your net worth of wealth. Right. Material assets. Class is purely education and occupation. That means a school teacher raising four children on her own at a $30,000 a year job, hypothetically speaking, because she has a master's degree in education mm -hmm. and because she's a school teacher, right. she's considered middle class. Middle class yeah. But when you look at the amount of money, money she, she take him, takes in, yeah. times the amount of children she's raising, she's below the poverty line. Right. But she's considered middle class right. because they took, you understand, net worth and income out of the definition of class. And it's only education. And occupation. So how? What's the solution? So how do we get that? So well, here's the thing: we you. gotta recognize that wealth is intergenerationally created. Mm -hmm. Most people who get rich don't get rich in a lifetime. Oprah, that's once in a while. Bill Gates, that's once in a while. Most people are intergenerational wealth. That means what? That if black people want to catch up, yeah, we have to start right. saving wealth and passing it mm -hmm. to the next so. generation. Our biggest problem ain't that we're splurging; is that every time we splurge, we're stealing from our descendants. You're giving them no inheritance to get started with. But the white child, they're starting out $100,000 plus, a million, a million dollars plus. And I think we have to become more strategic in the way that we do our health plans as well as our life insurance plans. Because what I'm learning with a lot of these white folk, a lot of them are getting their first, uh, uh, what you want to call a shock of wealth through the life insurance policy of their parents. We, we, we talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, so, life insurance policy. Yeah. Yeah. so there's so many different strategies towards wealth that we're not even thinking about because black people, our selfishness, it's also based on our, what you want to call it, emergency consciousness, survival instinct. We're only worrying about our life. We do not think about those who come after us. Now, you got to realize now, when we got out of slavery, white folks been already building wealth for a couple centuries. Right, right. We started behind the eight ball. Okay? So you got to play catch up. How do you catch up with somebody who's 100 yards in front of you? You have to run faster than they are. Right, right, that means right. we have to sacrifice our spending habits more than everyone else in order to catch up. How does a people who are at the bottom waste money more than people who are at the top? So not only are you not catching up, you're not even thinking, thinking about, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to catch up. Um, we, this is good. And we got a thousand questions and mm -hmm. we know you got a flight. Mm -hmm. We appreciate the time. Thank you. No one, problem. One fat get, meat juicy point. Mm -hmm. what, what would it be well, before you go? Um, I would say that we have to build our own schools. Everything we're talking about, the only way it becomes normalized, the only way it becomes a part of the collective black consciousness is if the children are raised with it as a group. Remember, all progress is group work, it's teamwork. That means we need all the children in Jackson to be taught the principles of financial empowerment. All the children of Jackson to be taught how to eat healthy. All the children of Jackson to understand what black family means and why it's so important. Until then, it's just a specialty. As we spoke earlier, diet being a specialty, wealth is a specialty. Think about it. If you're black and you're in the know about money and the laws of finance, you are a specialty. You are an eccentricity. You are an oddity. That's a problem. Because for white people, gaining wealth is a regular part of their everyday conversation. Even poor white people are regularly talking about wealth. Black people don't discuss wealth at all. We have to move it from the marginalized status it has and make it a mainstream topic of conversation. Is there an answer? I know you can't just drop a, a, five, a two second answer. No, no. For unity. Here's what I would say with the unity. Again, mm -hmm. unity has to be incorporated into the collective consciousness, which means children have to be socialized to unite with one another. Remember, our kids are socialized to disunite as a principle, right? I've had first graders, six and seven. Talking about how black your skin is, how cheap your clothes is, how nappy your hair. You're six. You just your first year in school. How do you know all this? The parents. We are teaching our kids to be Negroes. So the only way you're going to undo that is to teach them to be Africans, which is why I want my school to be residential. Because I know sending them back to the same house that created the illness after school is going to undo everything I do from 8 to 3. You got the kids for 16 hours. I got them for 8. I can't win. Because the brain is the creature of repetition. Whoever gets to this the most will rule it. What did Adolf Hitler say? Come up with a lie, 
Keep on telling the lie. Be consistent with it. It ain't got to be the truth. But the brain cannot resist the temptation to believe something that is regularly presented before it. Repetition wins. We give our kids the white folks for the first 18 years of their life. Then we want to remake them into Africans for the rest of their life. That's ridiculous. The formidable years of conditioning is birth to 12. The formidable years of conditioning is birth to 12. We give that to white people. And then when they turn 21, they already have habituated, they already have a personality, they already got hard habits, and now we want to re-Africanize them. Who does that? What people have ever gotten free, giving the best years of their children to their oppressor to manipulate them? The fact that half of all black men in America are unemployed, that nearly half of all of our children grow up in poverty, Poverty dictates a certain type of a diet, a very low income, a malnourished, a very sweet, a eat on the go type of a diet. If you look at a lot of our neighborhoods, the fast food restaurant chains predominate in all of the black neighborhoods. This is not a coincidence. When the black community came under attack by the CIA and FBI in the early 70s, late 60s, when the crack was dropped off in the 80s, the mass incarceration of black men led to the disintegration of the black family. Capitalism, seeing this, rushed in to capitalize on the fact that black people were no longer operating as family. If we're not operating as family, we're not eating as family, which means that we're often eating alone and on the go. The fact that many black parents have to work two and three jobs to pay the bills dictates I got to get my breakfast on the move, my lunch on the move, my dinner on the move. So capitalism saw this and they said, hey, we can get paid off the fact that black people are often on the go and have to eat as they go, that they have to eat a low uh, energy diet, a low income diet. And then on top of that, they're not eating as a family, which means they're spending more time outside of the home. So this situation, believe it or not, our diet is largely related to the systematic destruction of the black family. I'm going to go a step further though. When we talk about diet, as a psychologist, we often look at the intersection between spirituality and diet. And although food diet is critically important, thought diet is as important. I don't think black people, African people understand the extent to which how you think, every thought is a thing that manifests itself in your physical dwelling. You cannot think a negative thought except to create a negative thought molecule in your body. Every thought creates an atom, a molecule in the person. So a lot of the disease that we're catching is as much related to the impoverished diet as it is related to the impoverished psyche or thought processes of African people. Cancer is being triggered by negativity as much as it is by the foods that we eat. Uh, you look at diabetes that's being triggered by the anxieties and the fears as much as it is by the sugary sweets one of the things people have often pondered they say well how can we have vegans or vegetarians who are still coming up with cancer and they eat no animal products whatsoever how do you explain this with no trace of cancer in the genetics so it's not inherited you have to look at the spiritual diet and in and, and, and the thought diet you can eat well but that's only one aspect of reality. You have to think well, you also have to live well. And we tend to isolate these. Psychology over here, food over here, lifestyle over here. That trinity of lifestyle, food, and thought, or spirituality, is three aspects of the same reality. If you take care of one and neglect the others, you'll end up just as sick. I also believe that no matter how poor we are as African people, we can improve the quality of the food that we eat by educating our parents on how to prepare it for themselves. Okay, community gardens, and not only that, now the technology is such that you can grow crops in your house if you have the right technology. I know several Africans who have the farm indoors because they live in a place where they don't have access to land. So there's so many different ways we can improve the health of African people through education and opportunity. I think that's one area that we have to become more sufficient at. I think there's one area where our scholar warriors who are very adept at that type of science really have to step up and start giving back a little bit more to get our people on the right track. Number one, we gotta educate the children. 
it's going to be difficult to make any lasting change to any people or any community if that change is not normalized into the culture. Right now, eating healthy is still a marginalized area of activity for black people. It's a, uh, what do we, it's an eccentricity. You know, it's a specialty. Eating healthy is a specialty amongst black folk. That's a problem. Because if it's a specialty, that means most people do not do it. We have to normalize it. And in terms of normalizing it, one of the critiques I would have of the vegan and vegetarian community, don't be so extreme at first and in introduce an African people to an alternative diet. A lot of our people are being influenced away from going holistic because the holistic practitioners are coming at them with an all or nothing proposition. You cannot give a baby solids, you gotta feed them baby food. Don't tell them that they can only eat these types of vegetables. Don't tell them that they can't eat no animal products at all. Slowly grow them. Meet them where they are. Slowly wean them off the meat. Slowly wean them off the fish. And take them from that stage all the way on up. I think we're being too aggressive in our intent to improve the health of our people. And it's not improving them at all. Improving the health at all. Extremism. I don't care if it's dietary extremism. I don't care if it's spiritual extremism, political extremism, ideological extremism, religious extremism. It never works in the long run because the average human being isn't equipped or interested or has the motivation or effort to live an extreme life. So if we want to bring veganism and vegetarianism to African people, let's do it in a very realistic, practical, and patient fashion. Let's get away from the all or nothing proposition because we're going to lose more than we gain. Contact information. Contact information. DrUmarJohnson.com. Twitter and Instagram at DrUmarJohnson. Email uh, DrUmarJohnson at Yahoo.com. Please, please, please uh, think about joining the National Independent Black Parent Association, Special Ed Committee, School Finance Committee, School Discipline Committee, Policy Committee, Social Support, Homeschooling, and Parent Advocacy. NIBPA, aka Black Power, and Power stands for Black Parents Organized Against White Educational Racism. Black Power. Okay, thank you for spending time with us. Yeah, thank, um, thank you. We, we, it was too many topics. <laughs> we, we could spend hours talking to you. But, so we. we, we we, we really appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Know. Hopefully we'll get to work together. Yes, sir. Sure. We, 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 yeah, hopefully sure. We'll Let's do that. Okay. Thank you.